Now, the most surprising thing about the latest fall in support for The Voice in today's news poll is that for the first time, women are the most likely to say no, not men. And that's surprising to me because I thought, you know, women... Is this sexist to say? I don't think so. From my experience, polls tend to say yes to things that sound gentler, sound nicer, more compassionate, more kumbaya. But if this change is true, that women are even more likely than men to say no, then this voice really is toast. Joining me is Greg Sheridan, the Australian. Not only the country's top foreign affairs writer, as I often say, but also a prominent opponent of the voice and who's written a very powerful pieces against it in the Australian newspaper. Uh, Greg Sheridan, thanks for your time. Look, the Prime Minister said today in his interview with uh, Andrew Clannell earlier on Sky News that the more that people focus on this voice is OK, you know, the more they'll vote for it. But isn't the exact opposite now happening? The more people know, the more they're a no. That's absolutely right, Andrew. The, uh, once the opposition uh, declared a position against it, that guaranteed we got a bit of a debate. It's still a tremendously one-sided debate. You know, ABC panels and representatives are sort of about 100 to 2 in favour of the voice as opposed to those who are against the voice. And um, there's massive corporate money supporting the voice and massive government money in all kinds of ways and universities and institutions and so on. But as soon as they are presented with the arguments against the voice, the Australian people react against it. I mean, there's even a campaign... There's even been this huge campaign against having the leaflets presenting the yes and no case because the advocates of the yes case are terrified that even a little 2,000-word leaflet in the, in the post box might be enough to sway people against it. And if the voice gets up and I think it would be a tragedy for Australia if it does, it will be because of a massive exercise of government power and corporate money. It will have absolutely nothing to do with a grassroots campaign. If there's a grassroots campaign and a fair argument, it'll lose for sure. I think it would be so interesting if the grassroots say no to a campaign that's had huge money uh, from corporates where every corporate that's expressed the public position has been for a yes, not no, and yet the public give the whole idea the thumbs down, that will be fascinating, Greg. Whole theses could be read on, on what's happening there. But uh, talk to me about why you think women now, if this poll is correct, if news poll is correct, I find it counterintuitive, that women are now more likely to say no to the voice than men. Is it because they're the ones most likely to be dealing with you know, I don't know, household bills which are going up and up and higher grocery prices particularly? Well, Andrew, frankly, it's a bit of a mystery. I never really understand gender differences in voting. But so let me offer just one suggestion off the top of my head, but I'm not, I don't attribute any authority to it. You know, it's free and it's worth what you pay for it. The voice has become a matter of conflict. And that is right that it should be because the voice will guarantee endless racial conflict in Australia if it becomes part of the Constitution. I've argued in all my pieces that the voice is an Australian expression of the poison of identity politics, which is destroying Western political cultures all around the world. It's not destroying anybody else, the Chinese, the Indians, nobody else is going down this road, but Western political cultures are going down the road of utterly destructive identity politics. And the vituperation which the proponents of the yes case have heaped on the, on the, on the people arguing the no case, and, and there's been a bit the other way as well, is a sign of what we'll get. That's what the voice will give us. It, you know, all its advocates except the government say, yes, it can, you know, advocate to change Australia Day, advocate to change our defence treaties, advocate to change, um, you know, the tax rates or anything else. And I do think uh, you might generalise that female voters tend to dislike conflict. And if they see the voice as an ameliorative, sweet, consensual thing, they are inclined to say yes. If they see it as a source of conflict, they're inclined to say no. And it is accurately seen as a source of conflict. Well, it's, it's, it's built to create conflict because as soon as you say, you know, here's a body whose existence depends on the concept that their, their race is so different and so 
uh, you know, gives them such inherently different demands, then of course its leaders must emphasise difference to everyone else. So it's not a vehicle for reconciliation. It is guaranteed to be a vehicle for further division because that's where the power lies in being seen as different. Now, Greg, there is actually much in what the Albanese government's been doing that I think is not just wrong, some of it actually dangerous. This is just one example. But I have to say, uh, in fairness, there is one area where I think it is doing better than the Liberals uh, did in their nine years overall, and that is defence. Now, Albanese has just come back from the NATO defence meeting in Lithuania. NATO made clear that China is a real threat. We have to have a united defence with Australia and NATO included. But how prepared are our, our, our armed forces for this challenge? The answer, Andrew, and I've got a very big piece about this in Tomorrow's Australian, is we are dismally unprepared. Dismally unprepared. The Albanese government is certainly no worse than the Morrison government was, but here's the essential contradiction under which they labour. They agree with Angus Houston that these are the most dangerous strategic circumstances we've faced since World War II. They've signed on, like the Morrison government did, to the AUKUS nuclear subs. We don't get the first one until the early 2030s. We won't have our fleet uh, of eight until 2050. But they start costing us billions of dollars pretty well straight away. So in order to enhance our capabilities, you have to have a big increase in the defence budget. But instead, the Albanese government at this stage has merely committed to the same forward estimates in defence as the Morrison government did. Now, they've promised that at the end of the forward estimates, we're going to see a big increase in defence. But, you know, I've been a journalist, uh, I, you know, I shouldn't uh, reveal really for 45 years, and I've heard defence ministers offer every excuse under the sun for why defence expenditure is going to rise after the end of the forward estimates. So in the meantime, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're not getting a surface fleet with any capability... Yeah, four years is never. We're well, not getting new thing, missiles. We're not, have we don't have any it? armed drones. But how oh, often no, have you written... I'm gonna, you know, for what you, it's you worth, Andrew... You can't buy for... an army or a new navy, you know, just off the shelf and it's there tomorrow, you know? <laughs> you just got, oh, my God. Oh, Greg, That's I look right. forward to reading... So well, in a way, I look the forward programs. to reading what you've written tomorrow. Thanks. I appreciate that, Thanks, Greg. Andrew. Oh, my God. I'm prepared to be depressed when I read it. Thank you so much for your time.